just as an introduction, uh, the Atheist Society doesn't have any rules or even an agreed definition of atheism, but we would like to hear our speaker uh, with points of clarification, but uh, let him, uh, we will have questions <coughs> and answers after the presentation. I'll just give somewhat of an introduction to Michael, and I'll let him uh, give his own introduction after that. But uh, I first came across Michael in association with the Atheist Alliance International, where he was a coordinator, I forget the exact title, but anyway, he was very dedicated at arranging meetings with people all over the world at all different times. And I had the pleasure of meeting with atheists from Sri Lanka and also from Bangladesh, I think. So uh, that was where we first had contact with Michael and he's published a number of books. And I've got one here. This is Blasphemy, the Selected Works of a Blaspheming Atheist, published by uh, Atheist Republic. So it's a highly recommended book. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Michael Sherlock. Thank you very much for that, John. Um, can you hear me okay? How's the sound? Yeah, all good. So I'm right, no problem. All right, well, um, well, firstly, thanks to John for inviting me and thanks for everyone for having me as well. Um, as John gave me that uh, flattering introduction. Um, yeah, I, uh, I guess I got started in the atheist movement when I published my first uh, three-volume series, which was entitled uh, I Am Christ. Uh, no, I don't believe I'm Jesus. Um, so definitely not. Um, but the, uh, I guess the impetus of that three-volume series, uh, it was a three-volume polemic and critique of the Christian religion um, from uh, multiple aspects, including psychology, neuroscience, history, theology. Um, and so that's where really I started coming into, I guess that's where I, I entered uh, the atheist arena. I've always been an atheist. I, uh, this is going to play into a, a common narrative, but I'm a third-generation communist. So I'm not a communist myself, but my grandparents were communists. My dad, who raised me, was a communist. And uh, my grandparents were actually on the ASIO watch list uh, when there was the big communist scare uh, back after World War II. And dad, my dad was on that ASIO watch list as well uh, for being communist and being different and having, I guess, a different political view. Uh, my own, I'm not a communist myself, although I guess I do believe that capitalism does require uh, uh, some socialism to ensure that the most vulnerable members of society aren't trodden upon and left with nothing. So I do have that, I guess, that, that side of it. Um, but I'm definitely not a communist. Um, I'm too much of an individual to be a communist, uh, to be honest. Um, but that's essentially, I grew up in a very atheistic family in an atheistic background. Um, so I've always been an atheist. But where, yeah, like I said, where I came in was about 2012 when I published my first three-volume series with Charles River, uh, Charles River Press sorry, in uh, Boston. And then from there, I, I guess I ended up publishing seven books with traditional publishing houses and to really enjoy writing books and researching and all that. And for some strange reason, I got pulled into the atheist movement um, by actually another atheist author. Her name was uh, Acharya S, or she went by Acharya S, or her real name was Dia Murdoch, Dorothy Murdoch. Um, she sadly passed away a number of years ago. Um, her and I co-founded an ad hoc and very small uh, organisation called Human Rights for Atheists, Agnostics and Secularists. And in that organisation, we campaigned against blasphemy laws. Um, and with that, I was lucky enough to, I guess, work alongside or get the support of Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, uh, Ricky Gervais, Roseanne Barr, who's a very colourful character, uh, and another Lawrence Krauss and a number of other well-known I guess, atheist figures and, and public figures and celebrities. Um, so, yeah, the campaign against blasphemy went quite well, although obviously not successful, although we have made headway uh, as, a, as a collective 
um, as secularists. Um, largely, um, I guess, my, one of my biggest influences in the movement, the secularist movement or the atheist movement, has been Michael Nugent, who was and is the president of Atheist Ireland. I find Michael, I spoke at a number of conferences, uh, one in Estonia and one in Helsinki uh, with Michael Nugent, and he is one of the most sincere secularist and human rights activists that I've come across, and he's extremely capable, extremely intelligent, and I admire Michael very much. Um, and so I was lucky enough to work alongside Michael as well. And, um, yeah, from there, uh, basically, then I started campaigning for Asia Bibi, who was a Christian in Pakistan who was alleged to have committed blasphemy when more than likely the story was she was in a communal dispute with fellow Muslim, with Muslims who didn't like her because she was a Christian and essentially then uh, weaponised those blasphemy laws against her. And that's what we find in many countries that have standing blasphemy laws uh, that are active is that they are essentially used to weaponise the state against dissenters, against minority religions and against atheists and secularists. And I'm a bit of a sucker for people who are struggling. Um, and I think for me that was the biggest um, drive to get really active and involved in the atheist movement beyond just putting out knowledge and putting out information for atheists and religious people to read so that they could gain a new perspective. Um, yeah, so I guess that's the background. Um, as John mentioned, uh, I, John and I first met each other when I was the executive director of Atheist Alliance International, and I was a very active and maybe somewhat controversial executive director of Atheist Alliance. Uh, uh, the, the team there were they're a good team, and I don't want to speak ill of, I guess, the people I worked with in Atheist Alliance International. However, having said that, uh, a number of serious problems with that organisation has come to light. Um, and I began to see these problems in the twilight of my stint as executive director. And what I also realised was there was no... There was no changing it. I was only staff. I was only the executive director. I didn't have enough influence to, to change the pitfalls that existed with the board. And Michael Nugent, uh, who I spoke about, was very vocal in these, uh, with respect to voicing these problems with Atheist Alliance International. And these problems predated me to around 2017 or 18, I believe, is where the biggest problems began where the board were deliberately cutting out Atheist Ireland and other members who had a dissenting point of view and who were trying to steer Atheist Alliance International back to being an alliance of atheist organisations rather than a kind of hierarchical top-down corporate uh, entity, which it has become, or which became and has become, unfortunately. Um, there are other problems there, and if you want to read about those problems, uh, I would suggest uh, you uh, look up the Free Thought Prophet. It's a podcast on YouTube. Um, they detail all of the problems. And John Hamill, who was the former secretary and um, of Atheist Alliance International, and I believe former treasurer of Atheist Ireland or secretary uh, of Atheist Ireland, he's written extensively on the problems with Atheist, Atheist Alliance International. And I would highly recommend uh, you reading those issues because uh, at this stage, there is now no global atheist organisation besides perhaps Atheist Ireland, who are essentially an Irish organisation, but they do do global work and they are very serious about it. And Michael Nugent is very competent when it comes to liaising with uh, the United Nations Human Rights Council and so forth. Uh, and I was lucky enough in my role as executive director to work with um, the um, Human Rights Council of uh, the UN Human Rights Council, um, there and Amnesty as well. So I guess that's my background. I'm sorry, it's it's a little bit scattered, um, but yeah, my and I'd say one of my main focuses as an activist has been to move away, not move away, but focus predominantly on the struggles faced by people who leave the religion of Islam. Because people who leave the religion of Islam 
generally speaking, have a lot more severe consequences than people who leave the religion of Christianity, for example. And Islamic countries ruled by Sharia law, ruled by Islamic law, or even if they're secular on the surface, uh, like Pakistan, for example, is technically a secular country. Um, but nonetheless, when you have Sharia law operating in the background, um, it's, it's a nightmare for human rights, for freedom of expression, conscience and thought. It is an absolute nightmare. And I think one of the reasons why uh, we see additional struggles in the Islamic world uh, than we do say in, uh, well, now we won't call them Christian countries now, but Australia, US, Britain, is because Islam has yet to go through a secular enlightenment. That's not to say there wasn't a golden age of Islam, because there was a time in history where Islam was actually much more moderate than Christianity um, during the golden age. And, and thanks to Islam, we have some of the uh, uh, works preserved of Aristotle and the ancient Greek philosophers whereas the Christians at the time were running around and trying to burn all of these works so that they could rewrite history. And essentially that's what Christianity has been very good at doing, attempting to rewrite history. Um, so bear with me a moment. Sorry, my computer has just switched off. I don't know why. But no, that's all right. Um, yeah, sorry, a bit all over the show. Uh, but, yeah, so my main focus has been ex-Muslims, uh, looking after ex-Muslims and campaigning with ex-Muslims. You may have heard of Yasmin Muhammad. Uh, she's quite a notable ex-Muslim feminist and author. Uh, I have quite a close relationship with her. Um, but, yeah, so I guess that's been my main impetus. Um, whilst working as the executive director of Atheist Alliance International, my goal in that role was to essentially create uh, a much more interconnected alliance. Um, when I arrived at AAI, Atheist Alliance International, uh, there were, I, I'm not sure, don't, please don't quote me on this, but there may have been 20, 20 affiliates, potentially. I could be wrong. Um, and none of them were really speaking to each other and the board wasn't really speaking to them, but for a once-a-year AGM that they were holding. And uh, also Atheist Alliance International was presenting a right-to-be-secular campaign once a year at the Geneva Convention uh, uh, for the UN in Geneva, I should say. And my goal there was to make it so that um, the affiliates themselves could also lodge these objections. And so I, I worked with Michael Nugent, and what Michael Nugent taught me was that the ICCPR, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, comes up for review every few years in different treaty countries. So my thinking was rather than just the board of AAI, presenting this, uh, I guess, this right to be secular campaign at the UN uh, Human Rights Council once a year, what we could have is we could have our affiliate members in the treaty countries lodging their same objections, the right to be secular, et cetera, and protecting the rights of um, secularists and atheists and religious minorities. They could be doing that every few years. And then given that I'd built it up to about 50 affiliate organisations and then brought in large, um, I guess, um, what do you call it, advisors as well, like Michael Shermer and Lawrence Krauss, people that I'd previously campaigned with. I brought them in as well. So we now had a much bigger, I guess, mouthpiece uh, with which to campaign for the human rights of atheists, agnostics and secularists. And so my idea was that we would activate our um, affiliates and they would campaign on behalf of the issues they were facing in their country with the support of me and the board, and that was essentially my idea. Um, it almost came to fruition until, I guess, I came across the immovable problems within the board and um, some of the other problems I see with the atheist movement at large. So I, I did step down as um, executive director because uh, I think it was Sun Tzu who said, um, if you can't win a fight, then don't fight it. And I saw that uh, that fight is unwinnable in the end. So I um, I stepped down for my own sanity. But um, yeah, while executive director of Atheist, Inter uh, Atheist Alliance International, uh, what I found is that the majority of severe cases of abuse were happening in 
African, many African countries and particularly in Islamic countries. That's the trend I discovered when I was working closely with the Atheist Support Network, which was the aspect of Atheist Alliance International that took care of atheists at risk. And that was really, um, I guess for me, that was the most enjoyable part of that job is working directly with atheists who were under threat, uh, on the run, who had death threats, um, and not just atheists. For example, um, I ran a campaign along, when I say I ran a campaign, I mean obviously the board and the volunteers at AAI who were working around the clock. I ran a campaign for a 32-year-old Muslim gospel singer who lived um, in northern Nigeria in Kano State. And on a WhatsApp uh, message, he had been uh, told that he was praising his imam so much that it detracted from and made the Prophet Muhammad look bad. And so for this simple expression of his love for his imam, he was given the death sentence and he was due to be hung. Now, we rallied lawyers in Nigeria, from southern Nigeria, and uh, they formed a group, uh, Freedom From Religion. Uh, it's not Foundation, that's the, the big organisation, but they were like FFR. They were, uh, I can't remember the full name, but they were a group of lawyers who were dedicated to helping people in his situation. And we managed to raise enough money very quickly and go ahead and get those lawyers to Kano. And we managed to stay the execution just liter not literally, but virtually minutes before the noose was due to go around his neck uh, for what is essentially a non-crime. Another case that I was lucky enough to work, work, work on again in Nigeria, northern Nigeria, Kano, which is a very problem state because it is very Islamic, um, was a 13-year-old boy. Um, he wasn't 10 at the time, I think. No, he was 13. And as all 13-year-olds, I've got a 14 or 15-year-old boy now, but as uh, anyone who's got teenagers knows, they're very rebellious and they say things when they're angry. And um, So he had said something like, screw Allah or something like that which was a throwaway angry comment of a young boy and he was given 10 years imprisonment for a 13-year-old boy. Think about the insanity of that, okay? So we managed to get him off and he was released. Um, so that was another uh, very positive scenario. Then there was Zara Kay. I'm not sure if uh, you've heard of Zara Kay. Her case that I was working on as well, uh, it actually aired on the project here in Australia as well. And I, I managed to get, um, through my connections with the Ayan Hussey Ali Foundation, I managed to get Peter Dutton's office involved and DFAT involved into her case. Essentially, she's an ex-Muslim. She went back home to Tanzania and a bunch of Shia Muslims knew she was back and with the corruption that goes on in the police um, department there, uh, they managed to collaborate with the police and they took her passport and locked her up uh, for no reason at all. And then essentially she was unlawfully detained and then she was stuck in the country because they'd taken a passport. Um, in the end, Zara says that DFAT really did nothing to help her. Um, although from what I've heard, there was a bit of background politics going on between DFAT and the Tanzanian government because we supply them with quite a fair ounce of funding per year, particularly with respect to tourism and other types of funding. So I think there was some uh, I guess, back-end political negotiations going on there. Um, that was another case I got to work on, which I was, I was very lucky to do so. And there was another case of an LGBTQIA plus member. Uh, he was bisexual, ex-Muslim, outspoken, and he was in a refugee camp in Denmark. Uh, he was from uh, Tunisia, sorry, I, I may have mentioned. And he was being beaten on a regular basis by the other Muslim refugees because he was an outspoken ex-Muslim. He just, I don't believe in Allah, I don't believe in God. And so he was being severely beaten. So I was working working to get him out. Uh, unfortunately, it turned out that, I guess, he wasn't he wasn't the most savoury of characters and he, he'd been guilty of extorting women for money on the internet, doing all these other things. So whilst his asylum case was legitimate, his external behaviours in terms of blackmail and extortion meant that I had to drop the case. Uh, it was a very, it caused me a lot of cognitive dissonance, to be honest. Um, 
because on the one hand, you know, who do we decide deserves to live and die? Um, I, I do feel quite bad about dropping that case there, and it, it does it does weigh on me to this day, to be perfectly honest. Um, and then there was another case that I, I got to work on with a Somali refugee in Kenya. Um, I won't disclose his real name, but I occasionally reach out to him on WhatsApp to see how he's doing. He's still in Kenya. Um, he has to go house to house because other Somali refugees in or, or uh, Somali, there's a Somali minority. I'll, I'll give you context. There's a Somali minority in Kenya um, who are all, they're Muslim, obviously very, very Muslim, but they're also discriminated against by the Kenyans um, in very yucky ways. Um, but having said that, um, many of these uh, Muslims are very fundamentalistic. And so they were, they put a hit on him. They wanted him dead because he, he was an atheist. He called himself an atheist. Um, and so that was another case uh, that I was working on and managed to raise significant funds to at least keep him alive and eating while he was on the run. And uh, there was another case of a Somali woman, uh, I believe it was in Somalia potentially, where her family were, were beating her on a daily basis um, for denouncing Islam. She just didn't want to be a part of it anymore. She wanted to live a life on her own terms. She didn't want to wear a hijab or anything like that. And uh, so, uh, you know, I looked at the hospital records and all of this, and it was just absolutely heartbreaking. Um, so it was with, when I was working with the Somali case, the man who was on the run in Kenya, and through my affiliate meetings uh, with uh, the Atheists in Kenya Society, I developed quite a close relationship with Harrison uh, Mumia, who is the president of the Atheists in Kenya Society. And uh, we, we developed quite a good relationship together. So when I left Atheist Alliance International, and here I come to the main reason uh, for my attendance tonight, when I left, uh, and I'd been left for a while, I was out of the atheist movement, um, he reached out to me via message and said, hey, um, atheists in Kenya society uh, are being harassed by politicians and the law. We're being taken to the high court to be extinguished. Um, I tweeted something about the government and they, they fired me. And so uh, Harrison worked for the biggest, one of the biggest banks in Kenya, He's, quite, he's a very intelligent man, very competent man, but because of uh, his criticisms of the government from, I guess, an atheist president point of view, uh, he lost his job and he was on the verge of being homeless. And so when he reached out to me with these two problems coexisting, his uh, looming homelessness, uh, a man I developed deep respect for, and also the organisation about to be evaporated, which is extremely contrary to human rights, and also contrary to the Kenyan constitution, um, I couldn't help but get dragged back in. And so I have been campaigning to raise funds for the Atheists in Kenya Society and their high court case. And also I successfully raised funds to keep Harrison, I guess, sheltered and you know, uh, within domiciled, uh, let's say. So I, I was very fortunate. Uh, that I was uh, successful in that regard, although the fundraiser to save the organisation is only barely halfway, uh, if not even halfway to its mark, to its target. And the initial hearing was in, I believe it was November last year. I think November, January last, uh, November last year, I believe, or December, I can't remember. Um, but anyway, so they showed up and the, process, the um, other side, the complainants, I should say, Stephen Bichu is the politician who is essentially trying to get rid of atheist society in Kenya. He's a very Christian, very religious uh, politician. If you look at his feed, it's all rubbish about Jesus and all this shit. And so he is using the preamble of the Kenyan constitution, which talks about being un under almighty God, to try and argue that that preamble makes atheist, uh, the Atheist Society in Kenya um, an illegitimate organisation and that the right to free association, the right to freedom of um, thought and expression do not apply to atheists 
because of that little one-line preamble in the Constitution, which if you've studied constitutional law, you'll understand that the preamble doesn't form essentially a legal part of the document. It only underscores a part of the spirit of the document, all right? Um, and so he's using that to try and argue that this uh, align, this uh, organisation should be evaporated. And he has a very large following. As you can imagine, Kenya is a very religious country, although comparing to, say, Nigeria, it's a, it is uh, pockets of it are far more liberal and democratic and secular. So he, his trial has been deferred, their trial has been deferred, I should say, and he's coming up on the 29th of March, which is uh, not long away now. Um, and I am pushing to try and inspire people to donate to this fundraiser. And if they can't donate, to at least share it. There's also a petition that's going around that Harrison started and it has 499 signatures. Just need one more signature to get to 500. So any of you out there, please just sign it and share it if you can. Um, so they're essentially, I guess, that's a little background. I know it's been very scattered. I haven't been the most eloquent. Um, again, father of two teenage kids, you can't blame me. Um, but, yeah, that's, uh, that's essentially, uh, I'll leave it at there for now. And if anyone wants to ask me questions, uh, please feel free. Yeah, thanks very much, Michael. I will hand over to questions. Uh, let's see, I've got a, I'll, I'll say something to start the ball rolling. Michael, you're, it's very commendable, all of the things that you've done, I think. Uh, and it's, the work is such a valuable thing to do. Uh, you know, sticking up for atheists to the, really the most persecuted people just about. Because um, they don't have any allies, so it's it's just uh, commendable to try to do that work, uh, which is a very big job. So uh, congratulations on that, and we certainly do want to support that cam campaign for the upcoming case in Kenya. Uh, well, I don't have any. Not really a question, but one comment that came out uh, on something that you said, and that was regarding the so-called golden age of Islam, which was early. Well, when would that be? And the I think the it was thirteen hundreds potentially. Oh, I don't remember the dates. Oh, I, I may have been in the thirteen hundreds. Bear with me a moment. I can find yeah. it. Jeff. Well, I think it might have been earlier, but anyway, my, what I would suggest about that, it was more... Yeah, 8th, 8th century to the 13th century, uh, John. Yeah. Uh, it's presented as being an Islam, Islamic golden age, but I think in reality it's more like an Arab golden age because okay. the Arabs took over all of the Greek literature that they... Uh, that Christians were trying to destroy and kept it going. So you had a lot of the uh, work that's done by uh, a lot of the Arab uh, scientists, philosophers, and so forth. And yeah, but I, John, to, John, on the back of that point, John, um, I think you know I never shy away from blaming Islam when it's at fault. Um, when I can locate, you know, crimes in scripture, crimes in Sharia law, crimes in Islamic jurisprudence, when I never shy away. In the same way, I don't shy away from the fact that these were Muslims protecting Aristotle. These were Muslims who were protecting this information. So I think, yes, while I take your point, um, it was, and again, we, we shouldn't, I guess I don't use Arab in terms of, it's not an ethnic group. Um, Arab, Arabic is a language. So that's what unites, I guess, what we call the Arab people. Having said that, um, I think, yeah, you do make a good point. Um, it wasn't because of Islam that they were preserving these things. Um, it was just an awakening around that age. Um, so, yeah, I, I do take your point, but at the same time, I think we still it still deserves to be called an Islamic golden age, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. Well, anyway, I'd, I'd say it was more um, Arabic than Islamic. But anyway... Uh, so, uh, let's hand over to the audience. So we'll take questions from the, the live audience. I don't know if we need to relay them. 
Well, let me ask something, John. Oh, uh, yes. All right. I, I just whether Michael <laughs> sees any <laughs> any hope for the future, <laughs> whether whether the intolerance will just continue, or is there the slightest hope that something will ameliorate it? I don't know what, but <laughs> that's a, it's a very good question, David, and I, I don't think I, I would have a definitive answer to it, but. I guess there, yes, there is some hope. There's hope. Uh, look at um, Iran. Look at the teenage girls in Iran saying enough is enough. Um, we don't need our big brothers and our dads to fight our wars anymore. We're going to get out there and we're going to protest for ourselves. And look at the global attention that got. And one thing it reminds me, I think it's Ali Rizvi, who I have a lot of respect for Ali Rizvi. He's an ex-Muslim author. He wrote The Muslim Atheist. Um, it's a very good book. Um, one thing he said, he said that the internet is doing to Islam what the Gutenberg printing press did to Christianity. What he means is the good, when the introduction of the printing press came in and they started to be able to produce books, not just scrolls, but books, um, that fundamentally changed the way that average people had access to information. And with that increased access to information came the secular enlightenment. And Ali is arguing that now that you're seeing everyone's interconnected on the internet, there's a lot of negative things about social media and the internet, of course. Um, but one of the positives is you can't hide as much as you could anymore. Tyrants don't have as many places to hide anymore. They can't keep you know, oppressing uh, young girls anymore as, as easily as they could because we can all see them now and we can connect and we can cause movements that are sitting in Tasmania um, funding a high court case in Kenya for atheists. This is one of the powers of the internet and this is having a massive impact in Islamic countries particularly and you are seeing a burgeoning ex-Muslim movement um, not just in Canada and America, but also in Turkey and in other fundamental or in other, in like uh, Iran, even in Iraq, there are the ex-Muslims coming up. So we are seeing ex-Muslims uh, raise their voice more and more using that tool of the internet. And I think that, so David, do I see hope for the future? Uh, in sense of Islam going through a forced enlightenment, because let's face it, Christians love to take credit for, well, look at our country, we're democratic, we're so peaceful, um, look at Islam, look at those countries, they're theocratic, they're brutal, they're oppressive. Yeah, well, if it wasn't for the secularists and the, the fathers of the Enlightenment and the mothers of the Enlightenment, uh, Christianity would still be a theocracy. Uh, all the Christian countries would still be a theocracy because they would not let have they would not have let go of that control unless they were forced to, and they were forced to by Thomas Paine, Robert Ingersoll, and all of the brilliant uh, Mary Wollstonecraft, all of the brilliant thinkers uh, of the Enlightenment, of the women's movement, the women's liberation movement. They were forced to let go of that grip, and this is what um, Ali Rizvi is arguing is now starting to happen in an Islamic context. So I think, yes, potentially there is some hope for the future there, David. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I could be wrong. Well, if I can add a comment to that, uh, uh, yeah, it's good to have an optimistic view like that. But uh, it's, uh, I, I also, unfortunately, see a pessimistic side of things where uh, we can't criticize, like all the Enlightenment philosophers that you mentioned were very straightforward at criticizing religion. Um, and now it's almost become a taboo that you can't criticize relig any religion because you might offend someone. So and that's one thing I think for me that's... Offended. I think you've hit the nail on the head there, John. I think you really have hit the nail on the head. Um, it's to do with hate speech laws. In my opinion, all right, hate speech laws need to be rolled back. I believe, and I could be wrong, uh, please correct me if you think I'm wrong, um, I believe that the only time a hate speech or a speech should be considered 
under hate speech laws as actionable as a hate crime is when there is immediate threat of violence, not potential, not feelings, but immediate threat to violence. For example, religions, like you say, hide behind these hate speech laws and these blasphemy laws because you can't, I guess, you can't vilify or, you know, you can't hurt the feelings of religious people based on their religion. Well, that means I can't criticise the Prophet Muhammad um, taking a nine-year-old when he was in his 50s. And if you read the biographical material, he fondled her in the bath. Um, he, you know, he did all sorts of terrible things prior to when she was nine years old. He married her when she was six, um, did all these horrible things. She, she, and and the, the um, hadith and the biographical sources record that she took her teddy bears to his house when she, she married him. This is the type of age she was. And this is a man who, who was also a warmonger. <coughs> there was a Jewish poet who criticised him. Uh, I believe this is recorded in Ishaq or one of the other hadiths, where the Jewish poet was criticising him and he said, who's going to deal with this man for me? And one of his head chiefs said, I'll deal with him. And they cut the guy's head off for criticising the Prophet Muhammad. And today we see that same behaviour from Muslims, not all Muslims, let me make it clear. Um, yes, the majority of Muslims, particularly in the secular world, are very peaceful, loving. They love their kids. They want the best for their kids. They make veggie mite sandwiches like the rest of us parents. They yell at their kids like I do. They've got all the same struggles and everything we do, all right? But there is a large enough portion of fundamentalist Muslims who are causing absolute mayhem, not just in Denmark and England and Paris with their attacks, but more so against other Muslims in Muslim-majority countries. So, yeah, I, yeah, that's, that's my opinion. It's quite controversial, I, I realise, um, but that is uh, my opinion. Um, Rowan, you had a question? Uh, yeah, um, it, it was just that you're making the point that the internet is giving uh, assistance to the most radical forms of Islam. Excellent point. Sorry, um, what's the uh, questioner's name? Rowan. Rowan, oh, thank you. Uh, Rowan, yeah, excellent point. Um, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because ISIS, uh, one of their main recruiting tools is the internet, right? Is radicalization on the internet. Um, there was quite a good movie I watched. It's a, it's a recently released movie where a, a British journalist, a female British journalist, it was based off a true story, um, infiltrates an ISIS recruiting group. And she actually, um, in uh, getting the, the details of the story and infiltrating this famous recruiter, she actually falls in love with him. He's that charismatic that he almost convinced her to go across. When her whole, she went into it going, right, I'm going to expose this. This is a great story. It's going to save a lot of lives. She went into it. And then because it's like, um, I think it may also be Sun Tzu who said, you need to love your enemy before you can defeat him. She, she just fell a little bit too in love with the enemy at that time, who was that ISIS recruiter. And um, yeah, so to your point, Rowan, uh, the internet is an extremely effective tool for spreading fundamentalistic ideas, not just religious, but also political. So I definitely take your point, Rowan. Good point. Uh, Steve has a question. How can we keep the ranks again? Being a religion, say, how or something, how to do that? So we, what is it with the atheists who think we make it difficult for them to pull the I think I may have got the gist of that. And sorry, what was the question's name? Uh, Stephen. Stephen. Stephen, thanks. Um, thanks, Stephen. Um, uh, am I right in, uh, in saying that your point is um, why is it difficult for atheists to cooperate? Uh, yeah, well, that could be a question. It's like Richard Dawkins said, um, you know, it's like herding cats. Um, the trouble is when you have uh, independently minded people and generally speaking, although not exclusively, but generally speaking, 
Atheists tend to be individualistic thinkers, independent thinkers, generally. There is a growing online trend of conformity within the atheist movement I'm seeing, and that is within the insertion of critical social justice into the atheist movement. Um, we've always campaigned for same-sex marriage and LGBTQ rights and things like that. So because that's always been the case, when critical social justice came in as a, a social movement, it kind of it infiltrated the atheist movement to a point where it created mission drift in the atheist movement, and, and so many atheist organisations got distracted uh, from their core mission, which is promoting scientific reason, promoting secularism, protecting atheists at risk, um, you know, promoting uh, and normalising non-belief as a normal aspect of human experience. So the, in that respect, what we see is clusters within the atheist movement of conformists. We also do see a little bit of um, hero worship um, within the atheist movement as well, um, particularly around those called the Four Horsemen, uh, you know, Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins, Chris Hitchens and Daniel Dennett. Uh, so that kind of hero worship has kind of almost... What's that, sorry? Cults of personality. Cults of personality, brilliant. Yes, yeah, sorry. That is an excellent... That's what you call it. Thank you for giving me the actual terminology. Um, yeah, cults of personality, we've seen. So whilst atheists tend to be individual thinkers, generally speaking, we still do see that, I guess, almost religious conformity creeping into the movement as well. But again, Stephen, your point is right. It's very difficult to solidify a movement around a negative belief. Well, we don't believe in God. The, the, I'm an agnostic atheist, which means I don't believe there's no God. I just don't believe there is one, which is epistemo uh, epistemologically speaking, two very different positions. I don't believe there's no God. I just don't believe in one. So I'm reserving belief because I haven't been presented with sufficient evidence to my satisfaction to solidify a belief in something that I, I just don't see the reason to believe in, all right? That's me personally. That's, that's the type of atheist I am. So how do you form a movement uh, around that? Whereas when you have uh, Christianity, Scientology, Islam, you have ideologies that have laid out frameworks. They have very clear boundaries and fences. They have pathways that have been carved. So everyone knows where they need to be and where they need to go, what they need to believe, what they shouldn't believe. Now, having said that, I need to balance that because there is only about 45,000 different versions of Christianity um, <laughs> because uh, apparently God is a very clear author and his message is very clear in the Bible. So it's splintered off into about 45,000 different versions of the same message. Um, so you do have that splintering within religion, but within those I'm going to call them cults because I, I don't see a very big distinction between cults and religions. Within those cults, you have very clear borders and demarcations of um, ideological structures. And what that helps do is solidify tribes. And that is why I think they're much better at movements and uh, why they're infiltrating our governments, not just because they've been around and been socially accepted for thousands of years, although that definitely plays a massive role um, because we tend to be quite uh, sentimental about our traditions as human beings. But because they have such fixed and clear structure to them that they are easy to follow. So, and, and one example I'd say, I can't remember the quote exactly, so don't quote me, because I'm quoting someone else. Um, and oh, I'm running afoul of Oscar Wilde's quote now by quoting someone else. Don't worry, I'll, that's something for another day. Um, it was something like um, it is abusive to try and teach a poor person astrophysics. Okay, that's roughly the quote, roughly the quote. It is abusive to try and teach a poor person astrophysics. That sounds pretty yucky on its face, but it's true because what you need to be teaching someone who is living day-to-day -day trying to survive is how can they better their situation first? How can they first get out of that horrible poverty and live a life where they have enough leisure to reflect and philosophize and introspect 
like many of us privileged people do, right? So I think one of the problems that we face, I guess, with the atheist movement is that we've got so much leisure time now that it's almost, it's flipped the coin, so to speak. And I, I yeah, no, actually, I'm not going to go down that path. I'm going to cut it right there because I'm going to say something that's going to yeah, upset everyone. So, yeah, sorry. Uh, can I ask you to reflect on another observation I've got? That is that if you look at the census results, you know, people are getting much less religious. They're, you know, it's almost going to be a majority, majority soon to have no religion. So, so in that sense, things should be getting better. But we just see, but you know, the the, the results don't seem to reflect that, you know, because we still have such institutionalized respect for religion that can't be challenged. And as well as that, you've got, uh, you, you would expect that the reason and science viewpoint would, would be gaining dominance, but as well, uh, we all, we see all sorts of pseudoscience and crazy conspiracy theories going rampant. So, you know, it's kind of this contradiction. We should be getting somewhere, but we, we seem to be going backwards as well. What do you think about that? <clears throat> I think we have evolution to blame, to be honest. Um, if you look at our, our, uh, if you look at it from an evolutionary point of view, um, we are pattern seeking machines and we are belief creatures. Um, it's much easier to quickly form a belief and then get on with your day than it is to agonize over doubts. Okay, this could be the case. True, what about C? Uh, oh, you just can't get anything done if you live your entire life like that. So, particularly. All right, so circling back to the point before uh, we were rudely interrupted by the internet and listen to us talking about how great the internet is. Um, um, yeah, so essentially we're belief creatures and we are pattern-seeking pattern uh, machines. So we see patterns where there aren't any. And that's, I think, one of the explanations as to why people uh, believe in con conspiracy theories and see patterns that don't exactly, exactly exist. Um, it's like the phenomenon of pareidolia where you see faces in the clouds because your brain will fill in the gaps of any pattern to fit pre-existing models that you have. And so because we see patterns where there aren't any, because we're very quick to believe, I think it's going to take a millennia or more, even more, to evolve past that, um, that shortfall in our cognition. Although I could be wrong, given that we are speeding, look at technological advancements are speeding up, I mean, exponentially, where we're, our technological advances in the last 20 years alone, look at those. Um, so potentially we could see a faster evolving of the species in this manner, where we all become a lot more critically minded, a lot more uh, logically inclined, and a lot more or a lot less inclined to quickly develop beliefs um, but I think one of the secrets as well is not being afraid of cognitive dissonance. So for those who don't know what that is, cognitive dissonance is where you have pre-existing belief structures in your head. New ideas come in that conflict with those pre-existing beliefs and it causes a tension in the mind. It causes a little internal war. And Leon Festinger was the father of this theory of cognitive dissonance. And his study was on a UFO cult in the USA. And um, essentially, uh, it was Marion Keach, I believe, who was the leader of this cult. She said, well, what's going to happen is the aliens are going to come down. There's going to be a massive flood, original story we know. Uh, there's going to be a massive flood, and the aliens are going to save the faithful on their spaceships and take us away. And here's the date that the flood's coming. And she set at her mistake, she set a date that was in the near future. But we think that was a mistake, right? Because obviously when the day comes and it doesn't happen, you're like, ah, busted, and the whole thing disbands. No, it didn't, okay? It did not disband. That day came. The flood did not. And what Leon Festinger and his researchers, some of whom who had infiltrated that cult, 
what the uh, social scientists discovered was instead of disbanding the group, they created what's called rationalizations to keep that original belief intact. Because remember the original belief, the aliens are going to save the faithful aboard the spaceships when the flood comes. That's our original belief. Now, in comes the date and the non-happening of that flood as a conflict, right? And there's your cognitive dissonance. So how did they resolve that war in the mind? They simply said, oh, I know, our faith has actually stopped the flood. That's what's happened. Our faith has saved all of the USA. And so that's why. So people will create rationalizations to keep pre-existing belief structures in place because they are afraid to suffer psychologically. And I think we need to get past the fear of suffering psychologically before we can advance to more critically minded, more logically minded and more rationally minded creatures. Um, but again, I could be wrong. I live in constant dissonance. No, just speaking to the example of um, cognitive dissonance, uh, there were several religions, including Jehovah's Witnesses, where they predicted that Jesus Christ would come back, and of course he didn't. Uh, but he came back secretly, but didn't tell anyone. But they know they, they know that Jesus came back in 1918 or whatever, just forgot to tell people. Yeah, that, that happens a lot. And Steve, Steve did it happen to be on a piece of a toasted cheese sandwich, perhaps? Is it on a piece of toast? Yeah, he, yeah, he keeps coming back and toasted <laughs> cheese sandwiches. <laughs> but everyone kept eating it. <laughs> Steve. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just going to say I'm very troubled by the definitions. We use the word religious, and unfortunately it's all too convenient to use it. But religion doesn't necessarily entail a belief in a day. True. Religion's a practice. You can engage in mystical meditation and feel you commune with the universe, but it doesn't have anything to do with theism or a deity. You could have even an atheistic religion. Religion's a practice. But I would say that the term, the term you're dealing with is Theism. Now, I might just point out one of my other concerns. To me, it's obvious that theism, naturalism, and humanism seem to form part of a common category, but I just have never been able to work out a name for that category. But I'll just point out that. What do you think that we've got really the word religion, which really just means mysticism? contrasted against the word theism and I think they're both separate things and it's troublesome to conflate them both all the time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, what's your name? Uh Steve. Steve. Another Steve. Steve. Stephen, sorry. yes. Yeah, Stephen. Name. Second name is Stephen. Wait, is everyone Stephen in the audience? Because I'm just like <laughs> there's quite a few <laughs> <laughs> just say, right. um, Stephen, yeah, great point. Um, for my master, I did a master's in studies in religion, and um, one of the things scholars of uh, religion uh, agree on is there's it's almost virtually impossible to define religion. It's one of those things that um, I tried to write a definition. I was like, I'm going to break the mold, and I'm going to write a definition. And although my um, my supervising professor gave me a high distinction for my definition it's still not adequate. Um, you're exactly right. It doesn't necessarily need to involve a deity. Um, you're exactly right. That's theism, right? Or, or polytheism if it's multiple deities or pantheism if it's a kind of symbolic uh, deity. So, or, or deism if it's uh, a deistic kind of step back created everything. Now it doesn't want anything to do with anything. So you're exactly right. Religion is more than just practice though. Religion is a dynamic relationship between a set of beliefs, a set of practices, and an individual, as well as being um, a larger structure that embodies a community. So uh, even then, that's an insufficient definition. It's not even getting close. Um, but I have written a definition. Uh, if you're interested, uh, you can shoot me an email. I'll be happy to send it to you. Um, but it, defining religion is notoriously difficult. But I do take your point, Stephen, that I think you've made a very intelligent distinction between what we commonly call religion versus what is actually just theism, right? So what is a belief in a God 
or gods. Um, so yeah, I, I do take your point. I think it's a good point. Uh, thank you very much. Well, if there are no further questions, you might consider calling it an evening. Um, Michael, thank you very much for uh, a most uh, enlightening and erudite uh, presentation. And uh, yeah, I hope you'll be able to um, this is again with your expertise some later date. Okay. Enlightening and erudite. Uh, agree to disagree, John. Um, <laughs> perhaps scattered. Um, no, look, sincerely appreciate the invitation and, and thank you for everyone, you know, for listening to me waffle on and, and, and brilliant questions as well. I love this interaction where, you know, everyone's got their own ideas and we kind of come together and kind of, uh, you know, we learn from each other and I think that's fantastic. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to, to do this. And finally, on the final note, if you can afford to donate through the fundraiser for the Atheist and Kenya Society, please do. If you can't afford, don't stretch yourself. If you've got family commitments, just share it on social media. And there is also a petition there. You can go to my Facebook page. It's all there. So I just want to thank you all again for having me. And, uh, yeah, everyone stay well. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, Mike. Thank you. Bye-bye.